ladies and gentlemen and faces that used to be email addresses. I think I'm talking at a rather difficult part of the afternoon because you all had bar one at lunchtime and you had a coke as well and you had your sugar high and that's now wearing off. So I'm going to try and talk as loudly as I can, keep you awake. I first want to just give you an overview uh, of my involvement in astronomy and then what it's been like interacting with the layman and my use uh, of, of models and then just go through some of my outreach activities and then some of the issues that I have found are notable when actually dealing with the layman. So my introduction to astronomy was first of all uh, finding the Astronomical Society of Southern Africa. But way back when I was a kid and Grandpa bought me a 1.5 volt battery which was as big as a Red Bull can and it had a little 1.5 volt. That sort of really started the real interest in, in science and uh, I lived here in the Strand in Somerset West at that stage and used to look out for the satellites that had begun to start uh, going overhead. Um, I then joined the Pretoria Astronomy Centre in September 1985 and uh, that was coincidentally just in time for Halley. And uh, I'd been in the Kruger Park where some guy had propped up a telescope on the lawn and I saw him there and went out to have a look and uh, either he was having me on or else he'd actually gone through quite a few brandies because just about everything he saw he told me was a double star. So enthused and then back in Pretoria, I, I found a telephone number for the local astronomy club and it was answered, the phone was answered by Jack Bennett. Uh, what I managed to do then, uh, eventually I managed to get a key from Jack and I went and opened the observatory which was at the CBC College in Pretoria and opened the doors and was greeted by spiders and dust. And so I gathered a number of friends together and uh, we cleaned it out and we actually got the telescope up and going again. Uh, about Jack Bennett, sadly uh, when Jack was being crippled by arthritis, I and a few other club colleagues uh, who had, we'd helped him move out of his house and into the Mothwa Haven where he spent his uh, last days. And we've had the word C-E-L-E-S-T-R-O-N appear on the screen a few times today. One of the specific things that I remember Jack telling me was that uh, when he went over uh, to the United States for one of his awards, the Pickering Award, and uh, he was lying in his sick bed in Mothwa Haven, and I'd mentioned uh, Celestron. And he said to me, you know, it's not Celestron, it's Celestron. And he said they had told him, don't pronounce it Celestron, it is Celestron. So I've never forgotten that and how, uh, uh, whether it means anything or not. But that was just an interesting thing uh, that I remember from Jack. Uh, while I was uh, sort of helping him to move, he also uh, did, we were taking some of his books. And uh, what I was fortunate enough, well there he is with Patrick Moore, that was a video that was done at his house. And by the way, if you're in historians here, I've got that original video of that Patrick Moore program. And I bought this telescope from him, it's a little three inch refractor, which he'd ordered in about 1960 something. And uh, fortunately I have had thousands of eyes looking through that as I have dealt with people all over the place. And one thing I particularly want to do while I'm here, and I don't know if Chris is here at the moment, but I thought this would be an opportune moment. One of the books that I got from Jack was his Nortons. And this was the Norton in which he tracked his comets and plotted his novas. So I want to donate this to the society where it will get a far more exposure than what it does get on my shelf at home. So wherever Chris is, Chris, if you could look after that. So this gives an idea of sort of some of the sort of outreach that I have uh, ended up being involved in just one or two interesting ones, this little poor little girl. She's not a little girl, she's actually about uh, 16, 17, spino feeder, and she's stuck in this, and we managed to all pick her up just to get her eye close to uh, the eyepiece. And there I had Jack's telescope out in the, in the rift this felt. And uh, what happened at school was, you know, you do these aptitude tests in your last year of school. 
And they said to me, you've got to be a teacher. And I said, not a damn, thank you. I want to be an engineer. And uh, I sort of persevered uh, uh, with that and qualified as an electronics technician. And uh, little did I know exactly that my DNA had teachings uh, fairly strongly imprinted in it. And uh, I specifically uh, enjoyed interacting with the public at uh, various Outlook uh, outreach uh, events, trying to exp explain and get across my understanding of what I was seeing out there. And, you know, a lot of the time what I saw happening was people would point at something and say, now that's Mars, and fine, you've seen Mars, and that's Saturn, oh wow, it's beautiful. But I recall Richard Feynman saying that if you know the name of something, you know nothing. You've got to know what it does. You've got to know what it, uh, also as much as possible about it. So I really wanted to understand more about what I was seeing. And then, of course, I do uh, fondly remember this fellow here. And I'm sure many of you remember old Jan Volterbeek. I believe he's now in an old age home in, in Holland. And I can remember him uh, at some of our astronomy club meetings, sort of walking around trying to explain double stars and his hands were waving around. And it wasn't really all that clear what he was trying to get across. So uh, I did feel that I needed to try and do something to try and make it easier for people to understand and for me to explain. So I built that model. I borrowed a lot of that bandsaw blade from <coughs> Louis Barrens, a name you might remember, and I put that together in a camera tripod and I found that with that I could get over some of the problems that you have uh, in trying to get an understanding across to the public. And one of the big problems is that people tend to get very disorientated when you turn them upside down. So the model enables me to turn the model upside down uh, very easily so that it the view from the model is the same as the view who's standing next to me. I eventually did uh, improve that model and uh, to sort of make it available to uh, more people. But it's had uh, sort of this lovely, interesting use over there. Uh, Johann Smith, current chairman of the Pretoria Centre, he called me one day and he said, look, there's this young girl from Frafenek, she's blind and she loves astronomy. And so she was up in Pretoria, and with my model, she was able to reach out and touch the various planets and learn uh, all sorts of things. So that was a lovely application. I've got another photograph somewhere too of a young blind lady. Uh, in this picture, this was recently at Scopex, and just to give you an idea, there's a young child, Jenny's grandson, she's sitting at the back there, and after he'd watched me for a little while demonstrating, uh, it to the public, and then the next thing I was involved in other things, so little, uh, Brendan went and picked up the little pointer stick and he started explaining to people, so he caught on fairly quickly as to, to how to use the model. I did get a lovely feedback from a chap in Fentersdorp, uh, uh, a primary school, and he bought one of my models. And I wonder if I can actually quickly sort of try and translate anybody who really can't understand Afrikaans here. Really? Yes, Tony. Quickly, he said, we received your model yesterday and it was set up at 11 o'clock and the grade 6 and 7 learners, it was to teach them. And he said their eyes suddenly shone and for the first time they could actually see and understand what we are learning about the planets. Uh, the staff here are so impressed with the model and today, uh, Monday 15th of August, we are going to take the model to the grade 2 and 3 leaders and we can uh, really see the results. So I was very happy with uh, that little bit of feedback that I got from him. And then one of the things that I was trying to do with uh, people and kids was saying you cannot really remember things too well unless you really understand what you um, are looking at. So that's the only way you could remember. So eventually I ended up sort of building a little Southern Cross model and uh, because to try and explain where the Southern Cross is, you can easily learn, lose track of it if you don't know how it rotates. So that model does that. Uh, I built a model for uh, illustrate retrograde motion and these were all things I did in my garage. And then there's uh, Comet uh, Hale Bop, remember when that came around, and that little model as well explained why it came in from where and why you could see it from all the different uh, uh, angles during its uh, trip around the sun. 
Uh, I eventually, for an event that we did at our Pretoria Astronomy Club called the Jupiter Moon Dance, we did this at the Fur Trekker Monument, and there I suddenly thought, well, okay, people see these little stars, and we show them going backwards and forwards across the planet, but do they really know what they are doing? So I built that model, and with that model you could go and put the little moons of Jupiter in the specific spots that they were from that evening, and then just show them from the side. Very simple models, but these models actually do a heck of a lot. They replace a lot of words. Uh, you can see that my solar system model there was also used and just modified so that I had Jupiter in the middle and then I had its moons on uh, four rings around it. So it's uh, fairly adaptable. Uh, my various outreach activities that I've been involved in, uh, for instance, one, my uh, son at the school, they were trying to raise money for a cricketer to the U UK. And uh, so uh, f we had a fundraising event which went around astronomy and I built a, a miniature solar system on about half a kilometre on the school where people could take a walk along at night and actually go and see some, some write-up about this is where this planet would be and Jupiter would be the size of a marble and most of the planets were going to be the size of the full stops at the end of the little notice that I put up at each one of these. Uh, on a visit to Kruger Park in the 90s and there I let the camp office know that I was prepared to give a short talk one evening and uh, the first thing I did when people arrived there, I said, well, where are your binoculars? And they said, well, our binoculars are in the cupboard. And I said, well, why don't you bring them out and look at the sky? So uh, it's, not, not, it's amazing how many people don't realize how effective uh, they are. At the total solar eclipse in 2002, the uh, speaker who was meant to address the crowd the night before and just give them sort of a brief idea of what they were going to see the next morning, he was indisposed and uh, so I had to jump in at the last moment and there my model sort of came to my rescue as well as I had to fudge my way through that little talk. Um, I've also had the pleasure of doing various talks at, at, at game lodges uh, and have enjoyed the uh, crowds over there, although what I do find is they are not all very interested. A lot of them, them have been there for a company conference, symposium, and they've been involved in talks all day and by the end of the day, they're often tired. That's not really what they actually came along there for, but there will always be the two or three or four who will be particularly interested, uh, and, and they will keep you uh, busy with all sorts of questions. So just quickly, what are some of these issues that do crop up in outreach? And I'm going to go through some of these, but I don't think I'm going to say too much about all of them because time does fly. So first of all, it really helps to have a sense of perspective. If you aren't aware and understand your surroundings, there is potential danger. It really, really does help. And what's also important is a, is a sense of scale. That's the way you're going to understand things. There's me doing a little typical demonstration of the idea of arms out, sun on the one palm, earth on the other palm, if they were that far apart, how big would the sun be? How big would the earth be? And for those of you who don't know, the sun would be the size of a pea, and the earth on this side over here would, be, would fit into a sheet of paper. And Venus on the shoulder would also fit into a sheet of paper. So imagine getting a transit of Venus. You've got to align that little 85 micron thing with this 85 micron thing with this little pea on this side over here. So that gives an idea of, of scale. Uh, I recently have written a book, and in the book I actually used Pretoria and Johannesburg and now I built my scale model over there and I indicate how big they would be if the sun was on Nelson Mandela Bridge and if Neptune was uh, on Church Square. Neptune would fit under a desk, most desks at that distance and the sun actually fills the breadth of the Nelson Mandela Bridge. The other one that I often find is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, astounds people is my little moon roughly the size to scale with the earth and then I'd get one little kid to go and stand in the middle, and then I'd get the others to actually go and walk around. So, okay, now you the moon, and you go maybe two meters away, and then I'd say, is that far enough for the others? And they say, yeah, well, now you just come closer, others take that further. So eventually I say, go further and go further. And if I'm doing it in a classroom, eventually I have to tell the kid to go out the door of the class and go and stand out in the passage until he's about 10 meters away. And people are quite aghast that really that is how far, uh, far away the scaled moon is from the Earth. It's actually a long way away. Well, it's two days traveling, and... Uh, what, one second by, by its speed of light? 
A question, of course, is, I mean, you must have always be asked, how far can you see? So, I mean, it, you know, the quick answer uh, to that is it depends if the light gets to you, then you can actually see it. Uh, but, and people are also very surprised, too, about how close these satellites are that go around our Earth. You know, 250, 300 kilometers up, they are just skimming the surface. They are not far away, and you wonder how on Earth do these st things stay up and uh, do not crash. The other thing that the public really begin to glaze over with are big numbers. And I'd like to quote Daniel Kahneman, who is a Nobel uh, Prize winning psychologist, and he said to me, human beings cannot comprehend very large or very small numbers. It would be useful for us to acknowledge this fact. So big numbers mean nothing. Somebody said to me, anything over 100, the human mind can't really conceptualize. Uh, the light year, of course, is also a fairly confusing thing, whether it's, is, is this a distance or is this time. Astrology is also crops up as well, uh, and also this idea of the way things meant to be. When I have my model out, one of the first questions I often get from children, where's Pluto? And it's almost as if, well, my golly, it, we were meant to have a Pluto. You're meant to have a sun, you're meant to have planets, and they're all meant to have moons going around them. And, you know, I've begun to realize over the years that nature doesn't do its thing according to us. It does its own thing. It couldn't care what we think and how we try to categorize things. And the other thing, of course, is the dark side of the pe moon. Other pe people generally ask, what is the dark side of the moon? Can we see the dark side of the moon? So they're not really understanding uh, how we sort of do get the phases of the moon. And the dark side of the moon is simply the sun, the part on the far side of the sun. So... Uh, what is more interesting or meaningful to the layman? Is it to say that the light year is da 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 meters, or to say to them, you can see Venus in daylight, and I mean, with your own naked eye, and this absolutely astonishes people, and it sort of really gets their interest, and they actually want to go out there and try and do this. When I worked at MultiChoice a number of years ago, I told one friend about this, and MultiChoice was a, a building with a courtyard in the middle, and he and I were out there, and I was pointing up at this thing, and he was actually trying to, to see it, and the next thing, another two people came down, and eventually, in about 15 minutes, there were about 50 people around us, and all of them saying, what are you guys looking at, what are you guys looking at, and then each one telling the other one how to find Venus. So that was uh, uh, what sort of really gets people going. Uh, morning and evening stars as well. Uh, absolute uh, a regular question and what I like to say to people well okay you're looking at that uh, Venus there maybe in the morning star and the evening star which way is it going is it coming towards you or is it actually leaving you is it going away from you and by understanding and looking at the models you can actually really see oh well it's actually coming towards me and it's going to dip down between me and the sun so uh, you know knowing that kind of thing helps to sort of gain a sen sense of 3D 3D depth uh, the misperception too that we have these constellations where those stars are in the mind of people the they they have something to do with each other in being the scorpion whereas in fact they are often and most of the time just purely in line of sight so uh, with 3d and you're able to look at an image like that of the uh, southern cross and really see the uh, different distances at which those uh, stars are One of the other issues is, you know, people say to you, how on earth do you think that that thing, I mean, the scorpion you can see, the southern cross you can see, but all the other shapes, how on earth did people dream up what these things were? And the answer to that one is uh, really that one of the big scientific problems at the moment is trying to determine what they were smoking and drinking at the time that they dreamed up <laughs> what all these constellations represented. And I really love that little picture there. So, how much interest uh, is there out there? And yes, there is certainly a lot of interest. But this young girl here at the uh, opening of the National Science Week in Fort here a few years ago, she was absolutely so enthusiastic and excited. She said to me, I am going to be an astrophysicist. But sadly, I think there's a huge gap between what she knows now and what she doesn't know she has to know eventually. And it seems to be really one of the problems in the universities at the moment with the quality of education that uh, people have had up to now. And then the uh, perception of time. Now, of course, 
you know, we think in big terms of big distances in time. That's one of the things. But for me, what's amazing in time, a hundred years ago, there was one galaxy. And that one galaxy was the universe. And I've just read a, a book, and it's on my cell phone over here, by an astronomer guy in uh, 1909 it was written, and they were really battling to understand what these little nebulae were that had little spirals and so on. And really, and it's amazing to look back to 100 years' time, and they didn't know what they were. So, I mean, even Einstein would say, what other galaxies? I mean, my golly, you know, we've only got, there is the one galaxy. So, again, to uh, quote Daniel Kahneman, and he said, I never felt I was studying the stupidity of mankind in the third person. I always felt I was uh, making, studying my own mistakes. And I'd like to paraphrase him. And I felt that in my dealings with the public, I've never felt that I was educating or passing on privileged knowledge to people. I always did, and I still feel an excitement at passing on what I also once did not know and have eventually come to comprehend. It's been a pleasure talking to you.